Welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia. I'm Andy Cahan, Director of Author Events. Early on in Carol Hobson's new book, A Pair of Wings, Mrs. Bass, the formidable publisher of the California Eagle and mentor to Elizabeth Coleman, urges the pilot to write her story. Or as Ms. Bass says, Bessie, you must leave a trail. It's a call that both of our guests this evening have answered. After a 20 year career as a journalist working at the Philadelphia Inquirer and the Philadelphia Tribune, and then as a corporate executive, Carol Hobson followed her dream to become a pilot. She now flies the Boeing 737 for United Airlines as a first officer based out of Newark, New Jersey. Her debut fiction, A Pair of Wings, a novel inspired by pioneer aviatrix Bessie Coleman, was an Oprah Daily Best Pick for July 2021. The book tells the dramatic life story of Elizabeth Queen Bess Coleman from the cotton fields of Texas to the teeming streets of Chicago, onto Bess's training in France, and back to the U.S. and her storied career over the American skies. Tonight, Carol Hobson will be in conversation with Lorraine Carey, one of my favorite writers and author of the memoirs Lady Sitting, great title, and Black Ice, as well as three novels, including the inaugural One Book, One Philadelphia selection, The Price of a Child. A teacher at the University of Pennsylvania, her most recent writings include the acclaimed play My General Tubman and a one-act opera of Lady Sitting entitled The Gospel According to Nana. Carol Hobson, Maureen Carey, thank you so much for joining us this evening. The screen is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, Carol, here we are. Yay! All right, we're gonna we're just gonna do this straight up professional. We're not we're not gonna do this like family time, like on the uh, on the the car telephone while you're just getting out of Atlanta after 12 hours and when I'm leaving mom's hospital. We're not gonna do that. We're just gonna do books today. Your book, <laughs> your wonderful well, you know, book. You know a lot about books. So thank you for yeah. taking the time and of all the podcasts and things I've done, I am the most excited about speaking with you. Okay, all right, let's do this. I love to start with a reading. I always love to hear some of the book first, right? Um, and tonight we're gonna talk about Bessie, the book, um, you flying, uh, wings, getting young black people into the sky. All of that, it feels to me, is, is touched a little bit by this wonderful scene. Um, if you would read from page 193 to the middle of 194. You have the book right there. Read. Pardon me? You want me to read? Yes. <laughs> I thought you were gonna read. <laughs> oh. No, no, baby, you read. You read. Wait. Let's find it. Oh my God! Is here we got this. You know what's crazy? Guess what? I open right up to one ninety three. Oh, that's good. Um, would you start, please, with "We Were in Position." I'll try, but I must tell you, I didn't. I didn't put my reading glasses close by. I thought that you would be. Oh wow! And, and I was look. At, I have the same reading glasses. I wish I could just borrow yours. Okay, here. In the middle, <laughs> throw them. All right. So in the middle of one ninety three, where do you want to start? The rickety. No, I'd like you to start with "We were in position," and end middle of the next page with flying. Okay, Lord, you know, I need to practice, child. Oh, Lord. This I is it. Room. This is your, but the, your hometown, your hometown. This is where you were born. This, practice on us, please. All right, great. Here we go. Let me see. The, oh, this is from part two. Okay. We were in position. Ahead of us was a straightaway of the beach. Monsieur Quadron pushed the throttle forward, and I got a snout full of foul smelling exhaust mm. from the huge exhaust pipe that stuck up above the engine and ended in midair like an upside down oboe. The fumes wafted away as we moved faster and faster. The rickety axle between the twin front tires bumped and knocked as we sped away down 
as, as we sped ahead down the beach. Sand sprayed against us and tiny grains pelted my face. With a third of the distance necessary for takeoff now behind us, the stick gently urged itself forward and the tail nodded up ever so slightly as we gained speed. At 25 miles per hour, the rudder was effective. Our feet danced on the pedals to maintain direction. Just when it seemed like my brain uh, was being rattled to bits inside my skull from speeding over bumpy sand clumps, we increased speed and at 50 miles an hour, the pulsating wings came alive. I felt the engine surge as Monsieur Quadron tugged the tandem stick back and with the nose pointed to heaven. The machine lifted and the ground fell away beneath us. No more beach, no more pulverized clamshells, no more rattle, just smooth air. Beyond the salt marsh, beyond the acres and acres of opal expanse of sand lay the mighty Atlantic. As we climbed, I could see past the Somme Bay and into the English Channel. At this height, the water, which was a cold steel gray from the shore became a deep dark indigo and seemed to flow on forever in gentle undulating waves. My feet had been resting on the rudders since the beginning and now my eager fingers grasped the stick. Monsieur Quadron had been maneuvering both stick and rudder, and just as if we were dancing or making love. I followed his every lead. At first, we were doing the foxtrot down the beach, dancing fast, left foot, then right foot, right foot, right foot, then a little left on the rudders. But as we climbed through tranquil air, our dancing slowed to a waltz. My palms were moist with sweat. My knuckles were white but the resistance of the stick was gentle and there was no need to grab hard. Just the lightest touch made the airplane respond. Handling the stick felt more like caressing a baby than massaging a man. Same with the rudder, kick it either way and the airplane heeled off in the direction of your boot. The pedal leads the stick, Monsieur Quadron had repeated over and over again. These two, stick and rudder, were meant to work in concert. Being aloft felt like nothing I could ever possibly have described. No sensual pleasure could top the feeling of leaving the earth behind. It was as close as I imagined to what it must be like to actually go to heaven. I began to cry into my goggles and they immediately steamed up. It hurt to break the, the suction seal around my eyes, but I stuck my finger under the rim and wiped each eye and lens as best I could. Worried now that Monsieur Quadron would notice my loosened grip both on the rudder and my emotions, I glanced over my shoulder to catch a look at his face. His face, which had been so serious only minutes before, burst into a wide grin. I looked down and saw that he had let go of both stick and rudder. Woo I yelled into the wind at the top of my lungs. No matter that I was in France, I let loose a whoop and a holler Texas style, big enough to erase the years of silence and full of the pure joy of doing what my brother Walter said he knew to be true. I was doing what I had been born to do. I was flying. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Carol. Thank you. Um, I, I loved, I love, I love the France part. I love lots of parts. There's Chicago, there's coming up from Texas, there, there's going all over the country, there's trying to, um, um, when she comes back, but the French, the French part is the part that I um, see over and over and go back, go back and read. Thank you for that. Oh, thank you. 
Um, she she was flying. Uh, they were flying planes that were uh, World War One era planes. Yes, that's right. What's the closest to that kind of plane that you have ever flied? Fly, you've <laughs> flown. flown. <laughs> I know. Listen, it puts me like that sometimes. So I was very very fortunate. I was trying to do this. My first setup was outside. Because in the evening, there is a sunset ride of a biplane here. Uh -huh. And that biplane is called a Waco. A Washington, it ain't like Waco, like, you know, crazy. Washington Aviation Corporation. And they made this airplane that was a biplane that was 20 years later. So it was just before the jet age. And it's a, it's a radio engine. So the airplane she flew was... Uh, uh, was a rotary engine and then a radio and then finally jets but this airplane handles like her airplane hmm. so i was fortunate enough to meet a man who owned the airplane who owned the airport here in martha's vineyard and he had a gentleman who worked for him and he had two children two boys who were almost the same age as my kids and he came here, he flew all day, and he had these two boys. So he and I made a barter. I said, how about if I watch your kids for you? <laughs> and you let me come and warm up the airplane with you. And at first he said, wow, like that sounds like a better deal for me than for you. I said, well, don't get too excited yet because I want you to teach me stunts. I want you to teach me the stunts that Bessie Coleman did. And he said, well, who's Bessie Coleman? And I told him the pioneer time. And he said, oh, I get it. And I think, I think I'm gonna study a little bit. And when you come every morning and you help me warm up the airplanes, we'll go do some of the stunts. So we went, we did barrel rolls and um, hammerheads and loops and he taught me that if you hold a cup of coffee, I have a cup of tea in my, in my cup and you do what's known as a forward loop, you can hold the cup of tea and none of the liquid ever comes out. I said, let me see, I don't believe you. And that's what we did over and over and over again. And I would bring my cup of tea in the airplane. <laughs> and I would say, do the loop again. And then he would say, no, no, you do it. And we would do loops and barrel rolls and all sorts of stuff. And that's, and that's, so I spent three years doing some of the stunts that Bessie did. That you can feel that in the book. I love reading those parts because, um, well, because, right? Because I'm from the, the generation, I'll never forget reading um, Richard Wright uh, in Native Son, where the two boys are looking up saying, oh, look at that plane, I like the play. And then saying, you know, Nobody but white boys fly planes, right? That's the way I felt too. Yeah, yeah. So to to read this and to to have it to have the flying bits so felt, not just recorded but felt, um, I I find that thrilling every single time. I just find it thrilling. Thank you uh, Thank for you. telling us that. I might um, put up my light here. I didn't realize, I, I, like I was saying, I was outside so that you could hear the airplane. But mm -hmm. then I came in because it would get too dark too soon. So then I started the setup over there and then over here. So I might have to go turn on the light unless someone in my house hears this and comes up and turns on the light. But we'll wait another minute. Well, um, I think the way this works is that all you, although you and I can see each other when we're talking, but I think what what uh, Andy Kahan said to me was that when I'm talking, the audience will just see me. So I'll ask this next question, Thank you. and you can. There you go. Oh, come on, they heard me and they turned it on. I, <laughs> love this. I love this group. Thank you, Donna. Okay, you you open the book with with Bessie Coleman controlling a a crash um, was in, inevitable. I mean, one of the other things about this book is you lear we learned so much about the of the engines, of the planes, of the wing, of 
all of the, it, it's sort of nuts that these people were up there in these plants, but they were. Um, but you open with her controlling a crash that was inevitable, that the, the engine breaks apart and therefore she's got to figure out how to glide it. And um, she's trying to control this crash in order not to hit a schoolyard that's full of children. Did that happen? Okay, so the accident is real. February 4th, 1923, the accident's real. Fiction. Mm -hmm. I don't know what she was trying to protect. We do suspect that there was something. My sense it, is it was either something as I described, or it could have been that this was her airplane. I mean, it takes a lot to buy an airplane today. She cobbled together enough money to buy an airplane. Over what did she fly when that engine conked out? Because we do know that all that happened. But the flying over the children was fiction. Mm -hmm. um, in many ways, it was my own fantasy around the things that she loved. We know that she loved children. And she was, you know, at times her most playful with her nieces and nephews. And shout out to my own nieces whom I find absolutely positively funny and delightful. Oh, they're funny. Yeah, they're funny. <laughs> <laughs> they're very funny. <laughs> they're great. They're great. Well, but so so this 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 is the this is now we go from from Betsy, we'll go back and forth, but also the book. This is a book question. The book is inspired by. Right, that's what that's what the cover says. Inspired by the life of Bessie Coleman, so you have to figure out how to represent things you don't know. So, that's like you said, we don't know what she was flying over. We do know the engine. Okay, um, all of this has to do with who she is. You you said that you do know that she loved children. Yes. How do you know that? So, in my research, which I was so Oh my goodness. When I started out, I said, oh, this book, I'm gonna be done with this in a year. <laughs> I'll be done with this in six months or a year. Oh my God. <laughs> and yeah, right. So, and, and let me just back up for a second. So I started as an omniscient narrator, right? And I was just gonna tell the story, basically a biography. But that kind of, it didn't work. I couldn't get close enough to her. And then I used a ploy. Right. I had her best friend who was an amalgam of women I found in my research. I had her best friend who had two daughters kicking a ball around in the in the um, garage and they kick a foot locker and it comes open and the moths come out and they're her journals. And that was all it was working pretty well until Bessie's girlfriend, whom I named Norma has to describe lift to a 12 year old and she can't do it, right? Palms up. So I spent two or three years with the first one. I spent two or three years with the second one. And then it was redo and it was redo for real, for real. Um, as a, a friend of uh, mine, Joel Webley who runs Organization of Black Aerospace Professionals, he says, for real, for real. And so for real, for real, I had to figure out how to make that something that would have really happened. And then slowly but surely, some of the research that I did became very, very clear. So for example, she has a real grand niece and her name, great niece, and her name is Gigi Coleman. Gigi's mother was the daughter of Bessie Coleman's sister. And there are these stories of how she used to take the children to her apartment and spoil them rotten. And then after they had been sugared up and popcorned up and they had played and um, our dearest friends, uh, Donna and Vinnie are over uh, with us. And they, when I walked in from my trip, 
They were playing cards with the kids. There was joke going on. There was food. Um, Donna looked like a card shark. You know, she has this fancy little haircut and she had a pretzel in her mouth and she's dealing cards. And Vinny's talking about the kids taking his money. And she used to do just that with, their, with all her nieces and nephews. And they would spend time in her apartment. And then after, like I said, after they'd been sugared up, she'd send them home. <laughs> but it was grand. I mean, she was, she loved them. And that's how I conjured that she enjoyed children. She had fun. She was very playful. Okay. Okay. Um, and you're tough, my wife says, you're a tough interviewer. No, no, no. I've, this is stuff I want to know. If a book matters, <laughs> don't you want to? We, we want to know things. I love you know. Um, so along those lines, with with decisions you made about her life, she had a, an affair with uh, Jesse Bing, the black real estate tycoon mogul in Chicago, with uh, mob connections and stuff like that. She comes out of this in your book sounding really like a very moral person who sort of loves the glamour and, and has never had anything like this and, and has the affair, but doesn't, uh, she's not, doesn't sound like she's calculating, doesn't sound like she's cynical. And it doesn't sound like she wants to do this forever. You could have made her. I mean, she flies airplanes. She is a bad ass, right? So there's, there's no reason why you could not have interpreted her as, you know, doing, you know, sex like a cowboy. Yo, yo, yo. Well, there is a scene with the gun on the breast, but okay. So and then, <laughs> uh, spoiler alert, y'all, y'all got to read that. And a girlfriend of mine told me, girl, I sat down, I read that twice. <laughs> I, I had another question actually about, about why you made it an adult book as opposed to all these, these uh, young people's books. And um, the, the question there was, well, of course there had to be the Jesse scene, but but how did you decide that? How did you decide on her sexuality? Um, was she bisexual? Was it like, how did? I don't think so. Okay. I, I don't think so. But here's what I do know. I know that she loved her feminine side. I know that she loved how she looked, how I know that she, because of her confidence, she was less, um, she was the kind of woman who would walk into a room and say, hey, you know what, girl, that dress is fabulous. Because she felt confident. Here's the other thing I know. I know that people who are resilient have a sense of optimism no matter what. That resilience, I've done a lot of reading about resilience. Who is resilient? How do people maintain their resilience? How do people get strong, stay strong, believe in themselves even after tragedy has happened that has been so great that for most people, it just wipes them out. And I know a little something about that. I, as you know, was hit by a car when I was uh, 16. I didn't talk about it for 30 years. And in my United Airlines interview, a man named Joe Cook asked me a question. And he said, I want you to tell me about some incident, some something that has happened to you that made you come back from the depths. And it can be a physical thing, but it's something that affected you emotionally and spiritually and physically. And how did you return from the abyss. And, you know, I had practice and this and that, and I thought a lot about answers. My top lips started quivering. And I have a saying, cry before you die at work. I'll never want to cry at work. 
won't let you see it no matter what. And it was that that I tapped into, that that I understood how she must have felt for a young woman to be physically broken, to be spiritually broken and have to come back. That sense of resilience is something that at its core is, is optimistic. I'm going to beat this. I'm going to get back. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk again. I'm going to fly again. I'm going to go back to what I know. And there's something about that that is genuine. There's something about that that is so profound that some of that calculating, yes, was she calculating? Yes. She was sharp. She was charming. She was funny. She was playful. She was serious as a heart attack. She was all of those things that we are. And I do believe that while she had this incredible intellect, right? So she starts learning French when she's 27, masters it well enough to go across the pond and learn how to fly, right, in, in French. So all of those things are true. But at the same time, at the same time, just because one has great intellect and a level of sophistication in some areas, it doesn't mean that they're, you know, sexually and um, uh, in the ways of the world as sophisticated as they are in their language skills. And that multi-dimensional aspect is what I found so fascinating about her as a woman. And some of the research that I did was that she had all these different layers and some of the layers had great shade and some of the layers had great light, but she was not just this kind of cut out doll that we see in a photograph. She was much, 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 much more complicated, much more complex than she appeared in some of the photographs where it's just, you know, it's very stoic. And I was prepared for a lot of critique, which is, oh my God, you made her have sex. Well, you know, some of us would not have gotten here without sex. <laughs> I, I just, it's what I told, you know. Um, and so I wanted her to be this, um, I wanted her to be as attractive to people as she was to me. And the only way was to show these dimensions, this shade, almost as I'm looking at you and I'm looking at me and I didn't set up my ring light. So there's these shadows, there are these shades, there's light. And I, I wanted people to see these multi-dimensions of this. To me, she's a superhero. Yeah, and she flies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely, definitely. Okay, so true or false? These are facts in the book, and I think they're I think they're based on research. But check me. Um, the walk from her um, from her room or where she was living in France to the the flight it's it's too much to call a flight school, but it's where she learned to fly was nine miles. True. And she biked it some of the time, and then walked it some of the time. False. Right. Okay. She walked, she walked, yeah. she walked, she walked. Now, let me say this. I suspect that she may have borrowed someone's bike because true, I went over there, bought a pair of shoes as they made those shoes a hundred years ago. And I wore them today when I did the approach to Newark, which is oh, so fun. <laughs> you, you, you sweep down and you make this approach. And for me, I didn't know it at the time, but these boots that I bought, they have leather on the sole. So it's no like um, air and all that stuff that you get in the fancy Nikes. It's just leather soles and you can feel everything in them. So when I went, when I went over to France and walked the nine miles in the beginning, you know, the fat on my arm would itch as I was walking the first mile, the second mile, it would itch a little bit. Third mile, 
nothing itched, not even the fat on my legs. I was just moving like, and I was like, okay, what time do I have to be there? And it's getting dark. So I got to hurry. And then you feel like your endorphins leaving. You feel, you feel this a little bit of euphoria. And by the time I got from a place called who, R-U-E, like the name of a street, to Le Croitois, I was almost in a sprint. So true, she walked the nine miles, probably borrowed somebody's bike from time to time, mm -hmm. but bikes were expensive. Mm -hmm. uh, true or false, her signature low fly over audiences in the stands was a, was a signature move that she did when she came back um, and sometimes dropped what, scarves or something? Right, so little fiction, but here's where I got that from. True, she went to Roosevelt Field to do one of her first shows mm -hmm. and she's all ready to go. And this guy says to her, ah, sorry, this is an ex-military field and there's no trick flying. There was this sense that trick flying, right? Trick flying, air quotes, trick flying wasn't substantive that, you know, people who were flying, fly, fly, uh, flying high and fast, I'd like to say as long as the bladder could last, that those people who, who made records, the Federation Aeronautique Internationale, when they made records of the people and how they flew, that was where it was at then. Right, so in each decade, each time has their thing. Well, that's not why she went over to France. She went over to France so nobody would teach her to fly air. Yeah, no one would teach a black woman to get in an airplane and fly in her native tongue. So she did what she could do, and she probably enjoyed the trick flying. And when the guy told her no, the rest is fiction. And she flew over the top and drew the, because I'm going to tell you something, when you drop low and you're just, I mean, you're just gunning that engine. It's just fun. <laughs> it's just fun. A woman got off the airplane today and she had her bags and stuff. And I always greet the passengers and thank you so much for flying with us. Good afternoon. Please watch your step on the way out. Thank you so much. Right. And this woman said, girl, you sure were moving fast. Did you really have to fly that fast? That was really fast. How fast was that? And it was fast. It was it was the necessary speed, but it feels good. It just feels good to go fast. <laughs> so I so that's part fiction, and that was part me just having a ball. Good. That's good. That's good. Let me let me ask you this. You flew into Mexico this week. Yes, ma'am. They for, uh, yes, for you. Yeah, no, I really you did. You told me you did. Um, and you. For United, you took a plane this summer. Everybody and his mother is all crowding onto those air, airplanes. Um, and I think you once said that they feel, does it feel a little different when it's all full versus when it's not? Oh, you mean the airplane and how it handles? Yes. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. So, the airplane feels like a little rocket ship. <laughs> <laughs> So this summer, it's been all full up with all these people getting in there, doing their um, flying. Do you, so when you, you, you graduated from University of Virginia with a major in Spanish, is that true? I'll sit to the golden age. <laughs> so, and you do fly into Mexico and various Central American places now. Um, does the flight, do the flight towers speak to you in Spanish? Oh, so that's such a good question, Lori. Oh my gosh, that is an excellent question. So the English is the language of air traffic controllers all over the world. Oh. They're required. Now this is what happens. So you go down there and you say, you know, and, 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 you, and we are supposed to, not, we're not required to, but it's good form. United, instead of saying United 1050, United 1050. And you speak clearly and much more slowly than when you just rattle it off to Cleveland Center or Chicago or Atlanta. So, so we're to, you know, say it, um, and you pronounce each, each, each one and, and no shortening of numbers, 719, 719er, 
right? Or we say the number three, like tree, T, um, uh, it's, it's a phonetic alphabet, right? So A, instead of saying A, you say Alpha or Bravo or Charlie or Delta Echo. So in any event, when they, when say Volaris, right, which is, um, or Aeromexico, they will speak to each other in Spanish. But when they speak to us, they're required to speak English. I never and I, I rarely say never, and I rarely say always, but I never speak Spanish on the radio. And the reason for that, if I'm speaking Spanish to the controller, I count the other pilot out, right? So now the other pilot's out of the loop. And, and now what? Well, he said to send to 4,000. Oh, I got a question about 4,000. 4,000, you say 3,000. 3, so, so if I say... United mm -hmm. 1050, descend to 4,000 on the Volmar 1 arrival. Now we're both in the same picture. I've made a mistake. If I have made a mistake, or if the controller's made a mistake, the other pilot can catch it. And now the responsibility is what we call crew resource management. Why would I, you know, I don't want to take it on myself. I belong to a little, a crew, right? So if I get the guy out the loop, that's that's not using my resources. It's not smart. But Bessie, she had to do it all in French. Yes, yes. That's why I asked it because I I was wondering about about that. That okay. Thank you. That's new. You know, that's new. That um, that well, I shouldn't say that's new. But the FAA is relatively new to all of this. The organization Federation Aeronautique Internationale. I mean, that was established, I want to say the year was 1905 or three. And the FAA is, is much later than that. It's about 70 some odd years old. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> great, 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 great. She learned to speak French at night school in Chicago? At night school in Chicago. Wow. At night, and she was probably about 26 or 27 when she started. Right. And by the time she got over to France, she was 29. Right. And, you know, you mentioned Jesse Binga. So the two men, right, who were self-made millionaires in their teens who helped her to get there were um, Jesse Binga, right, and a man named Robert Abbott, who started the Chicago Defender. And both of them helped her financially and they also helped her um, just to figure it out so Robert Abbott starts writing letters in fact east coast west coast Chicago and no one is willing to put a black woman through school nobody so he says to her you know now this is the year probably 17 18 right he says you're going to have to learn how to speak French. That's, that's the only way. Doesn't that daunt you? So we know that that happens. Right. Fiction, I make up the conversation. No, I'll start tonight. <laughs> you know? And that makes, him, that makes him scareder than anything because now he probably says to himself, well, this, she's just too cavalier. Does she have any idea what she's taking on? Like, you know... Hey, you know, you're not really considering all of the hurdles. And so she does it. Yeah. Great. That's great. That's great. All right. We are, we are the point. Let's, let's um, look at questions from, um, from that have come in the audience. Um, U.S. Vans. Hi, Vans. Second. <laughs> asks, how may I obtain a copy of your book with autographs? Well, um, if that's the saying, uh, Ulysses Vance, I think it is, he is on the board of the Tuskegee Airmen of Philadelphia TA hey. chapter. Woo, I'm on the, board of, um, the board of advisors, I'm not on the, the board of directors. So I will make sure that we get you a book that is autographed. 20% of all the book sales go towards, um, okay, I hope you guys are ready for this, Jet Black. Guess where I got the name from? My sister. <laughs> so 
Lorraine and I were talking about a lot of stuff. Sorry about the car and the dog and all that stuff, like you just said in the beginning. So Lorraine and I were talking about many things, and Lorraine came up with this great name, Jet Black. I was like, dang, that is just, that's fire. So we have started the Jet Black Foundation. I just love my sister. <laughs> <It's> just... <laughs> All right, that's fine. That's great. And if uh, Carol, you'll share his address and I'll get a book to him too, because he has both. Uh, and Granger says, spectacular reading. Thank you for that. Karen Willis. Um, I went to college with Karen Willis. I see, says, um, hi, Carol. And uh, Wahua. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's a, it must be a University of Virginia thing. Okay. Tina Smith Brown says, How do you get girls and young ladies interested in flying? And do you feel that this is important to the aerodynamic field today? So, not just is it good for them, but is it good for the field? Thank you. That's a great question. Tina, I love you. So, real quick, I want to do something real quick. So, Lorene had us. Um, Tina was, was one of um, three of us, right? And we, Lorraine put us in our rooms and she told us to write and she dropped us off these gorgeous little baskets that had lunch and breakfast. And then dinner, we came together to talk about our projects. And a lot of what I wrote about um, soloing came from that weekend. So um, it was an amazing time of sharing. Tina, your question goes right to the heart of what Lorraine did for us on that weekend which was support. So let me share some numbers with you. Bessie Coleman went to flight school in 1920. June 15th, 1921, she gets her, essentially a private pilot, it's called a brevet. The French word for license is brevet. So she gets her brevet, number 18310, 18310. And she earns it on June 15th, 1921. I made a personal commitment to her to get this book out on June 15th, 2021, 100 years later. Here we are 100 years out from this spectacular event, right? Because we just talked about it. So no one would teach her in the US. So she learns French at night, night school, and then goes over to France. First flight school she goes to a guy says, I'm fact, I'm so sorry, but two women just died. I, France cannot have their women falling from this guy. No, you, but you cannot come here. And so she has another letter and she goes to the best flight school in France, which happens to be the Quadrone School and they make airplanes to help the allies win the great war. Fact, 100 years later, we have 100 less than 100 black women who fly for major airlines. If you include majors, the major airlines and cargo and military and sport flying and I mean, you name it, we have 150 black women who fly. Out of the 100 who fly for a living, corporate flying, cargo flying, major and regional airlines, of that 100, they we are. I am a I am a statistical insignificance. 100,000 people fly in that arena. Of that number, six percent are women. Of that number, three percent are African American, and of that number, the number of Black women who fly for a living are hundreds. We have a pilot shortage. We had one before the pandemic. And here we are on the other side of the pandemic and people are flying like crazy. We still have a pilot shortage. Now is the time that we need to tap a labor pool that, is, that has been virtually untapped. And that labor pool, I think is black women. Smart, able, plenty, ready. And I think, Tina, that question begs an opportunity. And now is the time, now, right now. 
Not to mention your R word resilient. There's a lot of resilience in the in the community of African American women. A lot, a lot that could be useful in the sky. Yeah. That could be useful in the sky, that can be useful on the flight deck, that can be useful inside the airlines. Now, my focus is on pilots, but I like to say, I like to use United as an example. We have at any one time 95,000 employees all over the world. It is truly a global organization. And every discipline that you can think of, customer service, IT, um, lawyers, um, doctors who advise us, uh, um, making uh, the, um, the inside of the airplane beautiful, right? From lights to seats to ergonomics to um, electronics to mechanics to, there are a hundred people who get an airplane off the gate for every one pilot. It's like a city of jobs. It's a city of opportunity. And we just don't know enough about how to get started. And I, I think that every job, whether you're flying airplanes, whether you're making donuts, whether you're writing books, or whether you got this gorgeous flower arrangement that my family gave me for my birthday, it doesn't matter what you're doing. Every job has two fundamental parts. And the first part is willingness. And the second part is ability. We can teach you how to fly, but it's the willingness, that part right there, that gets very hard to teach. Willingness and ability. And, and I, I think you're absolutely right, right. I mean, Black women are resilient. That's what we do well. And we can bring that to an industry that needs resilience, that needs a different way of thinking about things. Yeah, yeah, and I want to make clear here. I'm not. I'm not doing um, black femme supremacism here. I'm just talking about the body of experience that different groups of people bring to an industry, and I think the resilience has had to happen because of the experience of being uh, African American and female, etc. Um, there's a question. I gotta say something on this. I gotta say something before we leave this topic. So I necessary black supremacy or anything like that. I talk about numbers. I was flying with somebody, not this, not this last trip, this lovely fella, a couple of trips ago, no names. And this guy says, oh, I'm so tired of talking about black this and black that and the black lives matter and the this and the that. He says, you got your job, this and that. And I said, you know, I just want to talk numbers with you. How many of there are there rather of me? How many of there of, of, of you are there? What job am I taking from you? This is not taking from you. I am adding to. I'm you just talked about it again and again. The resilience, the where do we go? A lot of people don't want to try to be a pilot right now because it's so terribly expensive. And just like I talked about willingness and ability. So there are two things that lead us, I think, to training. And one is exposure. And that's what I can provide because it's very difficult to do this. There's seven or eight licenses before you ever step foot in teaching people. I can lead people through that because I had to learn the hard way. I don't want everybody to relearn the lessons I learned. I, I, can, I can make that part easier. And it's the FAA who, <laughs> this is such an FAA word, who certificates pilots, not me. I don't do no, that. no, baby, no, no, no. You can't say certificates on the it's free the library podcast. You can't do that. There's a lot of other ones. <laughs> but the point is, mm -hmm. the point is, yeah. and it is a word. That is mm -hmm. what we call it, mm -hmm. right? So it is who, who grants right, who grants licensure. And this license, it's a privilege. And it's an honor to be able to have people's lives in your hands. It is serious business. And sometimes we don't get entrusted with that responsibility. Oh boy, talk about it. Yeah, yeah. And what I'm saying is, 
100 years after she moved a mountain, we still are not in position. And it's because of lack of exposure, Tina. Such a good question. And I feel like I have learned that and I'm willing to give it away. And the only thing I want back is for each one that I teach and I know it is overdone. I want each one that I teach to take another one. That's what I want. That's all I want. It's so, you know, it's a key to a city. It's a great job. I mean, there's difficult times and there's, but what a neat opportunity. And by the, and it's a three, it depends, you know, three to seven year ramp up, sometimes a decade before you get to a major airline. But the amount of respect that you are afforded it's it's stunning. It's it's really something, and um, I want more of us to have an opportunity. I really do. I want to give that away, like she did. Her goal, Bessie Coleman's goal, was to teach other people 100 years ago, and here we are, 100 years out, and we're not even 100. We have to fix that. We have to give it away, like she did. All right, all right. We're um, we have six minutes, so we're now to the place where I'm going to ask you, and we're going to we're going to do we're going to brush through some short answers here, if if you would. Uh, where did Bessie Coleman learn to barnstorm? <laughs> she learned in Paris, Berlin, and Amsterdam on her second trip to Europe, and she learned from dog fighters in the First World War. Very nice. That's good. Um, uh, U.S. Vance has some young ladies, 10 to 16, that he's loving to, would, wants to introduce to your program. Um, we have someone here who wants to know what a first officer does during a flight. Do you fly the plane? Do you navigate? Um, and can you point us toward a good biography of Coleman in addition to her book? So last question first, good biography? Good biography, the best one that exists for adults is written by Doris Rich, and it is called Queen Best Daredevil Aviator, and it was truly my guide throughout my research. There's several others, um, a lot of children's oh, well, books. Can, can I interrupt you just for short answers? Sure. So let's just say it again. It's Doris Rich. Doris Rich, Smithsonian Press, Queen Best Daredevil Aviator. Great. Great, great, great. Okay, for um, teenagers, Philip and Tanya Hart wrote a, a book as well. Philip and Tanya Hart, H-A-R-T. Okay, thank you. Sure. And your efforts now to inspire other young black aviators. Um, this is a person who's inspired by the idea that part of the proceeds um, go to support this effort. Are there ways to donate? And is yes, there a and is there a website that they can yes. go to? Yes. So Carol Hobson, C-A-R-O-L-E, like Carl Lombard, my sister named me. <laughs> after mom. Mom was named after Carol Lombard. Right, right. So I'm Carol, just like my mom, like Lorraine said. Carol, C-A-R-O-L-E, Hobson, H-O-P-S-O-N dot com. And you can go there and donate. There's a link to Jet Black, or you can go to Jet Black uh, Foundation. Um, Kansas, because I think I got that right. Anyway, if you go to my website, you can link to um, Jet Black Foundation. And uh, we just obtained a 1C3 status. So I no longer have to say it's pending. But in any event, we suspect it'll be close to $7 million to get 100 Black women through flight school between now and the year 2035. And our goals are book, movie, because I just love movies. And we want to send 100 Black women to flight school. All righty. Someone thinks that they may have been on one of your flights coming into Mexico. Did you fly into BJX on 727? Oh, wow. BJX. I don't know where that is. No. <laughs> okay, that's a no. 
wait a minute. But wait, BJX, I don't know. Uh, most of the airports in Mexico start with an M, M for Mexico. I was there late July, but I was, uh, I did, I did a bunch of Cancuns here recently. Okay. I'm sorry. That's all right. Let's keep flying. Keep looking for you. I was great. Say fly. Do it again. Do, do it again. again. Do it I'll again. Um, <laughs> the, the, you have two question, um, and you can answer this yes or no. If it, are there any UVA experiences that influenced your research or writing of your book? That's from Stephanie Marsh. Hi, Stephanie. Yes, 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 yes. Um, I felt I, I was not a natural at University of Virginia and my sister knows um, I was I was very uncomfortable at first a northeasterner who was just kind of dropped into the south I struggled a lot culturally there so yes that sense of being um, an outlier and the cultural difference between the North and the South. And then Bessie having to travel all over this great country. Just imagine as a black woman in the twenties, barnstorming and living and working in California and in Texas and in Florida, Memphis, what? I mean, that was, oh my God. So yes, definitely there, there was some of my own influence in, in just thinking about how she had to make it through that, those times. Yeah, for sure. Great, great, great. Um, there are, um, this, this question has really been answered a few different ways and a lot by that last one. Differences or similarities uh, that you, or similarities that you share with Bessie or, or um, ways in which you're different. This is from Kara. Hi, Kara. Um, so, so here's what I'll say. There are a lot of similarities, right? Um, one is I love going fast. Oh my goodness. I love flying. I, 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 I love using my thumbs. I, I love using my feet. Um, I love teaching. So when I was an instructor, and I'll make this answer very brief, when I was an instructor, I would do the takeoffs and landings. And on the very first flight, I would allow my students to fly the whole sandwich in the middle. And I love that. I love, 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 love that. Um, some things that are different. I have modern conveniences like this Zoom call at my fingertips. I have, my beautiful sister has resources. She did not have those. She was very vulnerable as she was, when we say pioneer, she was a pioneer in almost every aspect. And yet she was peerless. I have peers. Not many, but I have peers who have helped me and mentored me, and she did not. So in those ways, we are very different, much stronger than I could ever be. Um, that's, that's a huge difference. It's one of the reasons why I wanted you to start out with that first quote, because we can hear, we can hear the, the, the flying and we can hear the, the love of it. You have people here from, that was uh, Vanessa, um, a line. Uh, Vanessa Lee. <laughs> <laughs> says she's loving it this much and wants to know, and maybe we'll make this the, the last question because it is time to go. We're a minute over. But you also have Joyce Lewis, uh, Kenneth Boone. I Kenneth think. Boone. Um, C. Bonet, who's there? You don't remember C. Bonet was on Addison Street with us. Sharon <laughs> Lozier. Um, <laughs> Uh, who talked to you on the Outer, Outer Banks. We spent this magical weekend at Kenny and Fran Boone's house and, how, and they were there and it was lovely. Uh, how long does it take to become an employable pilot? Just give us years from this to this. So um, I did all my training really fast. I did my, all my training in about eight months. So I went from zero hours to a flight instructor, there are about seven different licenses in there, half dozen, let's say. I did that in, in um, less than eight months, uh, six, seven months. So that's, it usually takes about a year and then you work at your craft. And that ramp up can be anywhere from three years to five years to get you to a regional and then from um, a regional to a major. 
And when we're when we're since we're in the wrap up, let me just share this with you. So Vanessa Aline just went. Um, I forget where she went. I think Las the Cabos or somewhere, and she was sitting and she had the book on top of her lap. And she said the flight attendant and other employees just came out and were like, oh my God, who is that gorgeous woman? Oh my goodness. There is a thirst that we have, I think as women, but definitely as black women, we say, oh my God, are we really that beautiful? Are we really, did we do that? Yeah, we did. We did that and we can do it again. And that is the spirit of Jet Black. That is the, the goal that I have like in my little heart, you know, book, movie, 100 Black Women in Flight School. And I throw my feet over the bed every morning. Dear God, thank you for this day. Book, movie, 100 Black Women in Flight School. Clear, it's clarity of vision. Sometimes that's all I see, you know. Thank you. Before we thank go, you. I want to say thank you to you. And thank you, um, thank you, sis, for all your support. Thank you. You're welcome, Ben. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you for Jet Black. Oh, yes. All I right. got a great husband right. and two boys, and they've been wonderful. Great, great. Uh, last question. Is there anything about um, a reason why someone asks why passengers are sometimes called souls? Oh, souls on board. Yes. So, um, when and then I, we'll we'll end with that. You'll answer the question, and then we'll go. Thank you. So it's actually a little bit morose, actually. So oh, sorry. If, if anything were ever to happen, right? And you needed to tell crash, fire, and rescue. You needed to do an emergency. It comes from a um, um, a naval past. How many souls do we have on board? Sobs. How many live human beings are there on board? Souls on board. That's, uh, you know, so we do it. We do that count on every flight. And so in what's known as our final weights, how much, um, how much does the airplane weigh? How much does everything weigh? How many souls are on board? All right. Thank you that your this soul was here tonight. Thank you for the souls who tuned in. And here's our best to the souls who listen to it later.